Grand Sage Illich, son of Latric, was at a loss. Like his forefathers, Illich was a telepath, a being endowed with the ability to read and occasionally manipulate the minds of other beings. His race, the Chanarai, was so proficient in this, they were derisively known as the Mind Flayers of Planet Nemosine throughout the galaxy. Give or take a couple of variations, the same old cycle would repeat throughout the centuries. A new species somehow managed not to annihilate itself before achieving FTL travel. The Galactic Federation would then send envoys to add them to their illustrious ranks. The rest followed like clockwork. The powers that be would turn to the Chanarai, have them peek into the collective consciousness of the new members. Such a feat would have taken more than a few hundred cycles if not for the fact most, if not all known Federation species shared some form of hive mind with their people. Other than a few anomalies here and there, a member of one race was virtually indistinguishable from another when it came to having their minds read and catalogued. Being who they were, the Chanarai would effortlessly peel back the layers of a thousand myriad minds and turn over their findings to high command. In exchange for their services, Ilix people received generous tax exemptions and other boons from the Federation and their Luconian Imperial overlords. While planet Nemocene and the Chanarai certainly thrived under this arrangement, such blatant favouritism did little to endear the Mind Flayers to the galactic community at large. However, all that changed on that fateful day. Without much in the way of pomp and circumstance, the Galactic Federation announced the discovery of a new planet and the recruitment of its dominant species into their ranks. The planet's inhabitants called their homeworld Earth, shorthand for Terra. For their part, the inhabitants called themselves humans, human beings, or people. Desk cluttered with reports, half-eaten leftovers and other rubbish. Illich realised this was the chance he'd been waiting for. He would present to the Nemosian Council of Sages with the following proposal. He and at least a thousand Hammock volunteers would travel to Terra and live among the humans for the next couple of cycles. More than enough time to read and catalogue the minds of these primitive apes. Such a bravery would surely earn Illich a post among the Imperial Scientists of the Luconian Empire. Right. Wrong. For starters, human beings numbered by the billions, whereas most Federation species seldom exceeded to the hundred thousands. Unlike normal races, humans had no fixed mating cycles, and little to no readily enforceable restrictions on the number of offspring they could have at any given moment. Being so thoughtless and impulsive, Terrans had spread all across their homeworld, even its uninhabitable regions, making it particularly difficult to secure a subject pool that would meet the rigid testing standards set by the Nemosian Council. Second, unlike other species, humans didn't share a hive mind. Even the most tiny knit enclaves allowed for significant variance among their members. One member might agree with another on certain topics, then bear irreconcilable discrepancies on others, a fact that drove the telepaths under Illich to scratch their collective heads on several occasions. Third, no human being was identical to another, not even to themselves, at least not always, a lesson Illich himself learned the hard way. A single human comprised an unfathomable galaxy of self-contradictions that at best had only a passing resemblance to those of other humans, let alone other beings. Furthermore, human minds constantly shifted. The mind of an individual human could be one way this moment, then dramatically change to the next. Then came the most baffling discovery of all. Human minds are practically boundless, yet another lesson Illich and his associates learned the hard way. Translated from Standard Emotion. What do you mean you lost the thread of Subject Alpha's mind? Researcher Tolmec, they were right next to you. My sincerest apologies, Grand Sage Lake. I followed all our rules and procedures. I did not lose sight of Subject Alpha, not even for an instant. One moment they pondered the fate of a person named Beers, who disappeared centuries ago. The next they shifted to thoughts of a strange vessel. Strange vessel? It was like no spacecraft any of us have seen, sir. This one did not fly. Instead it floated on water. That lethal blue substance that enshrouds terror. The vessel ran across some kind of floating mountain, then floundered beneath the waves, taking many to their deaths. Next I knew, Subject Alpha shifted to something called what-if scenarios. Roughly speaking, the subject went through alternate chains of events in about as much time as it took for our ships to travel from Nemesine to Terra. Impossible. No man can think so swiftly. What next occurred is a blur. Subject Alpha pondered, would the ship have sunk if it crashed head-on with the mountain? It then switched to some other topic. Would having prepared the lifeboat sooner have saved more people? Did the vessel shatter or did it explode? To make matters worse, the subject then turned their attention to a hypothetical situation where they made the acquaintance of a Terran who perished long ago, one Wilfred Owen. Who is this Wilfred Owen? Terrans label them as a he, therefore designated them as male. He penned several works of linguistic artifice, 
before meeting his untimely demise during a great war of sorts. Great war? Leave it to Terence to glorify wanton slaughter. Thank you, researcher Talmac. Once he took his leave of Talmac, Gillick went over yet another strange case. A dark-skinned Terran, a child, had unknowingly brought researcher Gebol to suicidal despair. The lad's mind worked much differently from that of other humans to such an extent, his thoughts shifted as fast and often as he might blink. One moment he pondered whether he could combine an apparatus he called an NES with a Sega Genesis, and then another he termed PlayStation 1 for infinity, then dropped the matter altogether to ruminate the best possible way to explain to his maternal unit that C- he received on his examination that day. Illich had Gebel confined to the sick bay till further notice. He couldn't risk him taking his own life, at least not before he shared the rest of his findings. Next came researcher Vildam. She was in what humans call hysterics. One moment he was talking to me about what he does for a living, the next he thought it would be most pleasurable for me to share a bed with him. The things he intended to do with that filthy apparatus. I broke the link by the time a substance called pesto came into his mind. He intended to mate with me, then consume me for sustenance. Vildan, such a shame. One of the brightest minds of the current circle reduced to an incoherent babbling mess after a Terran minute speaking with one of those construction workers about something called a Shakespeare. Illich would never forgive himself if she never recovered. She was to be the bearer of his spawn after all. She just didn't know it yet. Pacing back and forth outside the audience chamber of the Imperial Palace at Ilaurus, capital homeland of the Laconian Empire, Illich vainly thought to impose coherence upon his train of thought. This couldn't be happening. A species that shifts thoughts faster than they can utter syllables, whose minds aren't bound by rules of temporality or reality, and can easily bludgeon blatant contradictions into coherent ideatations. How would he explain any of this to Chief Scientist Amdurses? The Illyrian was already difficult to appease. Illich would be lucky to still have a job, to say nothing of his own life, after all was said and done. 